Hello. Hello. Good morning. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, fabulous. Um, thank you, Martin. Thank all of you for coming out. Thank you, Kathleen, for that fabulous presentation. It's a good setup, actually, because you're talking about what we should do. I'm going to tell you what my department actually did. Um, <laughs> But no, I'm, I'm going to talk about my experience. This is weird. I usually talk about my projects. I usually talk about the things that I built, and it's not me I'm talking about. It's the thing we're doing. And this one's going to be a little different because I'm talking about my experience. And I'm going to give you kind of a little autobiographical kind of walkthrough of my experience, both getting into digital humanities, projects we built, and then therefore the challenge when I arrived in my department at UNT with a digital portfolio and the charge to go build more stuff and also write a book and maybe we'll give you tenure, we'll see how that whole process goes. <laughs> so I'm going to forgive the personal pronouns as I, as I walk through some of this stuff, but I want to give you guys a sense of where I was coming from and what it, what it looked like in the trenches. I really want to give a kind of like where I was in that whole experience, not as, a, as an example that should be emulated, but just this is what it was like for somebody in my particular case at this point uh, where we are with uh, the field in digital humanities. So I began over here at the University of Virginia um, as a graduate student. And I had not gone to UVA thinking about digital stuff at all. I barely used email. Um, I arrived in the early 2000s and I was only there, I say only there, it's a beautiful place to be for all kinds of reasons, but my main reason for being there was that I wanted to study the South. I wanted to study slavery in the 19th century. I thought these were major issues and questions that had to be wrestled with, and it was a great place to study that. And the person that I was going to work with, a guy named Ed Ayers, was a leading scholar, is a leading scholar of the South, and that's why I went to Mr. Jefferson's University. And when I arrived on the campus, I had no idea that before I got there, UVA already had a burgeoning and, and, and really field defining in the 90s and early 2000s, early mover in digital humanities, right? We had the Institute for Advanced Technology and the Humanities, IF. We had this thing called the Virginia Center for Digital History that Ed had helped found and create. And I sought none of that out um, until my advisor, like a lot of us in the field who stumbled into it in the 90s or the early 2000s, I came into it because my advisor approached me. Ed said, well, wouldn't you like to make $10 an hour this summer? And I said, yes, I would love to not starve. That would be terrific. He says, well, I've got this project called the Valley of the Shadow Project. And I said, what is that? And he says, it's a digital archive thing. It's on the Civil War. All right, I'm working on a book on the Civil War. For those who've never heard of the Valley Project, it was a, one of the two founding projects for IF at UVA. It's about the Civil War. It's about two communities in the Civil War. And it's really a purposeful archive, right? This was, um, I think of the Valley Project in a lot of ways, one of which is that it was an archive that was built around the idea of the early, of the 90s, DH community of democratizing access to information, building a purposeful archive. And so I got my start working on this as, as, a, as a, a grunt in the trenches, so to speak, transcribing things, marking them up in XML, learning what TEI was, all that sort of stuff. And it was fabulous and interesting, but the question that was always being debated among some of us graduate students who were working on this is, is this scholarship? Is this different than what we could do in an analog environment? That was kind of an open question in the field for a very long time. And we'd get asked that a lot, and we'd come up with very defensive answers about why, yes, of course, this is different, and you couldn't possibly do this in any other sort of way. But I always wrestled with what that might actually be. And what got me into believing in using digital methodology in my scholarship was working on the Valley Project. You guys see the middle part of the archive there that says the war years that deals specifically with the, that period of fighting from 1861 to 1865, we had this really cool thing that was built in Flash, the battle maps. And what the battle maps were, it's what it sounds like. They were these maps that follow the movement of some of the um, people who lived in the valley who were being studied by the project. We took their, art, their records from the National Archives and we made these maps that animated the movement of regiments across Virginia during the war itself. Right? And so what you're seeing here, this is a still, unfortunately. I couldn't show the actual piece because Flash is on its way out. But um, you had an animated timeline where you could see the movement across space by the battles. And this is sort of late in the war when this, 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 this moment is. And it was amazing because you could see things moving around and it gave a sense of the, of the experience that you didn't get in tabular data. Like we'd had it in, 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 in table form. They fought here and then they went there and then they went there and that was 
fabulous, but then you watched it. And it gave you a sense of, oh my God, how are these guys alive at the end of the war, right? It gave a sense of the, of the, the length of the experience in a way that was different. And I'm not sure that that was a, an insight you couldn't get other ways, but for me as a graduate student who was working on this and was thinking about my own research, I start, started thinking, visualizing data has power. You can actually do something with that. And that it, it could give you some sort of an insight. And for me, and again, I apologize for the personal pronouns, but at this point, I was, I had gotten through my comprehensive exams, yay, and I was now told I can go write my dissertation, super, and I was thinking about this, because my work was on movement of people, all right? My research was on American Southerners in the 19th century who had been going from Virginia down to Mississippi and Alabama, and that was really interesting to me. They're moving and migrating during the Cotton Revolution of the 18-teens and 20s and 30s and the road to the Civil War. And then some of those guys, instead of stopping in Mississippi and Alabama, kept going, kept going further south and west and ended up in Mexico. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. If they're going from Virginia and they're going to Mississippi, they have the U.S. Constitution that protects slavery. They've got a lot of things they can, they can use to, to build a new slave society. But if they go to Mexico, now they have to explain to a new government why slavery is an important thing for them, and they have to get outside their comfort zone and try to build a slave society in a whole other set of circumstances. So I started working on those kinds of things in my own work as a part of my dissertation. And so I built my own digital project at, the, at UVA, at the Virginia Center for Digital History, because we had a support network that would allow a PhD student to do that sort of thing. And part of what I was trying to figure out was the same thing we are doing with the battle map of the Valley Project, which is how do people move around the landscape? What did that mean? All right? And so it, really I was just copying what I would already seen. In many ways our ability to imagine is one step beyond what we have already seen. And so I, I built an entire digital project where we were building out how did people move across my landscape using a lot of the same ideas we would used for the battle maps, and that's what I was trying to emulate. And this, for me, scholarship-wise, was the, the Kool-Aid moment, all right? Where I was able to take um, tax records in this particular case that re recorded where slaveholders had moved into Texas when it was a part of Mexico, and then when it was its own republic for nine years, where they had been, where they'd moved, both slaveholders and enslaved people, and I could animate that movement across time and space. And that was amazing for me because I could see those spatial patterns unfold in a way that I could not get while I'm just looking and staring at tabular data and understand how these proportions were changing over time. And then I could layer in GIS, and then we built an interface that mimicked GIS to make, put it up on the web. We could layer other data sets on top of it to try to see how people are moving and where they're going. And I had insights from that, scholarly insights, that got me closer to answering the questions that I was trying to an answer in my dissertation. Right. So my point is, because I was at UVA, and because I was exposed to some of these things, uh, and because I had the infrastructure to build upon, my scholarship was, from the very beginning, both traditional in a sense I was writing a paper dissertation, right? There was going to be a paper output that my department would recognize as such, but it was also integrating these digital tools that we were building in the Virginia Center for Digital History, and they were integrated with each other, right? So this is kind of an and kind of model, right? I have a traditional and the digital, and they're talking to each other, and they're both put, uh, put side by side. And I always point out, just real fast, I was one of the only, I'm not bragging, but I was one of the only graduate students who was building their own digital project at the time from our Department of History, even though we all had access to this. And a lot of it was because we only had this much time and this much to do already. And a lot of my colleagues in the department, my fellow graduate students, were very worried about putting their time and resources into this digital side of things. And if it didn't have meaningful outputs for the other side of things, what that would do possibly to their very early careers and all of that. They were always aware of how vulnerable they were. All right? and I want to emphasize that to everybody. When you're coming up through this whole process, through the tenure review, up until the moment you're tenured, you know always at every turn how deeply vulnerable you are in this entire process. And, and that's a terrifying thing. But one of the advantages of doing these digital things is it does make you different, right? And especially when I was doing it in the early 2000s, there were fewer of us working on this. And so it did help lead to uh, my first job job. Um, when my advisor, Ed Ayers, who was Dean uh, of the College of Arts and Sciences at UVA, then took uh, the presidency at the University of Richmond. 
And Ed wanted to continue doing digital scholarship work, and so he wanted to establish what became known as the Digital Scholarship Lab at the University of Richmond. And so I was already living in Richmond, we had been working together, I'd been doing my own projects, and so Ed asked me to become the founding director at the University of Richmond of the new Digital Scholarship Lab. And this is where my scholarship became primarily digital, all right, where I dove in with both feet because that was the charge from Ed. And it was a very freeing experience. This is one of the most beautiful things I could have had because Ed believed in what we were doing. He could set the parameters of what we were doing. And he said, you need to go experiment with digital projects, build some examples, and see what we can kind of create. And he gave me both the freedom to do that and some resources to do that, but also the understanding that this would be good for my career <laughs> and it would be, would be understood by the institution as something that's a worthwhile investment. So we built some different projects, and this is the one that, uh, that Martin was talking about earlier, Voting America, which we did 10 years ago now, which is just kind of terrifying to me, and we did this in 2008, where we took every presidential election up until at that point, 2004, and see, tried to see if we could visualize that data over time and space, which we figured out there was about 1.3 billion votes that had been cast in elections since the 18, from the 1840s up until 2004, which is a lot of information, right? And that's the thing that the digital makes possible. You can deal with these scales of information that are impossible to sort in an analog sort of an environment. And what we decided to do was try to build all these different animated maps that take that historical data and allow us to see it in data visualization form over time and space. And so here's an example of the kind of thing that uh, Martin was talking about. Again, this is just a still from it, but you can see you can hit play and you'll see these animations of voting from the 1840s to the present. In this one, in particular case, there's dots for every 500 votes. Every 500 votes, there's a dot. Every red dot is a Republican. Every blue dot is Democratic. Every yellow dot is a third party, um, third party votes. And you can see these storms of elections that come and go over time and space as you see the, the, the different trends uh, from the 19th through the 20th century. It's fascinating to see, especially because you can see visually some amazing patterns that emerge that we often talk about in scholarship, but, but have a hard time um, explaining how they, they fill out, except for this one right here, which is what I posed on to show you guys. You guys see the map from 1920 right here? What do you see on the map as far as voting is concerned? My students always say, no one lives in the West. Yeah. <laughs> yes, there are some people out there, not as many. More people live uh, on the eastern side of the country, absolutely. Where else do you say? It's very red, that's right. It's very northern too, isn't it? My students all say, and everybody lives in the north. It's north and no, nowhere else in the country do people live. And I say, no, actually, what you're seeing here on the map is, this, is the effects of the Jim Crow regime of the late 19th and early 20th century, right? All the efforts to suppress black voting, but also suppress white, poor white voting, that just guts the South during this time period. You can literally see it in the maps as this completely different region. And we talked about this at the time. This is a, uh, 2008. This is about when, when Obama was running for president. We are talking about red and blue America and these divisions. And we are talking about the spatial dimensions of, of, of elections and all that goes on with that. And we were mapping some of these patterns and trying to discuss these things. And there was a lot of amazing insight that came with that, a lot of community engagement that came with that. Google got involved with, uh, with our project and then published some of the stuff on Google Earth, all of which was really interesting. We also built other projects like the History Engine, which I'll just, I'll just skip over right now, which is a, something that allows undergraduates to upload their own research into uh, an online connected um, database. But the point of saying all of this is to say that early in my career, I got involved in doing digital work as an integrated part of every part of what I was as a scholar. And then at the University of Richmond, I was given free range to build a digital portfolio and had the support network to actually do that. And the result was my first tenure track job, right? The digital launched me into that and because it made me a different candidate than a lot of the other people who were applying for the job that I got at the University of North Texas. So when I was finishing my dissertation, I knew I didn't want to stay at the University of Richmond, not because I didn't love it there, but I was a staff position. I was not in the history department. I was doing research projects, but what I really wanted to do was my own research agenda. I really wanted to work on particular projects that I was interested in, and I wanted to be in the tenure track line because I wanted to be in the history department. Um, and so at the University of North Texas, there was a job advertised for somebody who works on borderlands stuff, which is what I did since I was doing Southerners going into Mexico. 
And there was also a, and if you do digital stuff, that would be nice line in the, in the job ad. I go, I do that. I can write that in there. That'd be fabulous. So I applied, obviously, and my, my application, I was later told, um, went to the head of the line because I had a significant digital portfolio. They knew they wanted someone who could do the, teach the certain classes they were interested in in our department. But by 2009, when I was hired, they were convinced that this digital thing is something, and we want to be a part of that thing, but that's about all they figured out at that point, right? Nobody in the department did digital. I want to make that very clear, but they felt they were being left behind. Therefore, we've got to get somebody who does this sort of thing somehow. So that's why they were mildly more interested in me than the other 4,000 people who had applied for the job. And so when we started getting into negotiations, they were very adamant, you have to do digital stuff. All right, I said, that's fine. I like doing digital stuff. I said, can we define that? And they said, yeah, we'll just, we'll just take some language we already use for the sciences, where we would have lab, and then we'll make a digital history center. And so my, my job letter that hired me said, you're going to be in the history department, you're going to teach these kinds of classes, we're hiring you to do this kind of work, but we also want you to, you'll be charged with the development of digital programs in history with the expectation that you will develop a UNT approved center for digital studies in history. What did any of that mean? Nobody knew, all right? I want to make that very clear, right? My dean and my chair, who were very supportive, I want to make that very clear. They were excited and supportive, but this was sort of, we're not really sure what you're going to do, all right? But you do need to do digital stuff. And I said, okay, and I want to do that. And I also really wanted a tenure track job. And so I was like, all right, we can do this, but I need to know specifically what does that mean for tenure? What is that actually going to mean in practice? Do I just make a center, or does there have to be output for that, right? And my chair said, we'll figure that out when you get here. And my dean said, we'll figure that out when you get here. And I said, okay. And so I, I got there, and we started having these conversations, and it, it, it turned out my dean and my chair did not know. And then they had a couple of conversations and decided, well, we have to figure this out. Right? And this is the other theme I want to point out from my experience. They didn't have to figure these things out until they had a problem. Does that make sense? They had to have me being a problem, and I mean that in the best possible way, before they were forced to go from the theoretical to the actual. Right? Because it was all a, sure, we'll figure that out until suddenly I'm standing there saying, what does that actually mean in practice? Mm -hmm. And so what they came up with is the and answer. Right? Mm -hmm. So their answer was, well, um, we have to, you have to do the traditional book. There's no getting around that one because that's what everyone in the department understands and the college, so we're doing that. But you also have to do the digital projects. And now that your letter says that, well, it's in there, so you got to do that too. And if you do that, you might get tenure. All right? <laughs> so please do both. We very much appreciate that. Um, Good luck. <laughs> I said, do I get more time? Said, no, 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 no. It's six years, that's the, which is really five anyway. So just run with that, see what you get, all right? So the first thing I did, of course, well, I did, I did these two tracks simultaneously, all right? The first thing was the most obvious thing, which is I was going to take my dissertation over there, which was kind of a, not a mess, but it wasn't what it needed to be, and it certainly wasn't what I wanted it to be. I knew I had to basically rewrite the whole thing for what I wanted the book to be. I understood that. So I started on that process as its own track. But then at the same time, I'm going to start building digital projects in a digital lab or center, whatever this is going to be. And the university said, good luck. Mean, my college said, good luck. The library said, we will help you. All right? I want to make it very clear about that as well. Um, Martin actually joined UNT at the same time I did, and we became very good friends. Uh, in part because the library has a wonderful digitization lab. They were very interested in the kinds of work they were doing, and they became very supportive in one of the first digital projects that I did build at UNT, which Martin talked a little bit about, which was taking the massive quantity of newspapers that our university was digitizing. Um, at that point, it was it's for the Chronicling America project. At, at the time I arrived at UNT, it was 250,000 pages of newspapers, which I thought was an astounding amount of information. Now they're up to about 7 million pages, so things have gone up quite a bit since then. Um, but the idea was to take that collection and then try to find new ways to visualize the language patterns embedded within all of that, to try to make it more useful for scholars to, to understand what's really embedded within these massive digital um, archives that are being created so that you can be more efficient and pointed in what you're trying to uh, explore with, 
with the, those archives. So I won't go through a lot of the project right now, but we built all these visualization tools, all right, where you could visualize how clean or dirty the OCR was. So you could see how useful it was to actually do searches across this material, where the quantity of information uh, high points were, both in terms of time and space. We built a lot of language metrics so that you could query the entire collection um, you know, on word counts of various sorts. We experimented with topic modeling in various sorts of ways. Um, we did that project in, in concert with Stanford University. We got an NEH grant for that that underwrote that from the Office of Digital Humanities. We built a lot out of that, right? We also started building a project um, at UNT that I'm still working on called the Digital Austin Papers, which is one of those scholarly editions things that has also kind of always been on the sidelines, but the digital has, has, has made more prominent than it's been for a long time. Where we're taking the papers of a guy that was in my book a lot, Stephen F. Austin. And if you ever heard of him, he's the lead land agent who brings Americans to Mexico during the 1820s and 1830s. We had almost all his correspondence that we could digitize, and we put it online, and that was fun and dandy in a sort of accessy sort of way. But we built all these other tools that we're still working on uh, to allow new access to the language patterns within Austin's writing. So this is, this is a histograph of the quantity of his writing over time, but the red and the green you see right here is the sentiment embedded within his, his letters. We're working with sentiment analysis that are an emotional index over time of how grumpy Stephen F. Austin was versus how excited he was at a particular time. And it's a different way to explore language patterns embedded in these kinds of collections. I love mapping things, it's just my thing. So we're also mapping his, his correspondence over time and space so that you can see the, the geography of his ideas and correspondence and correspondence that he's working with over time and all that sort of stuff. All of which is simply to say, we built up, I built up, a big digital portfolio in concert with a lot of colleagues. All right, this is something else Kathleen talked about, is that I was doing none of that by myself. I was doing it in concert with a whole lot of other people. But over time, I had built up all these different pieces. I had the stuff I built before at UNT, Texas Slavery Project, Voting America. But at UNT, I built two major projects, Mapping Texts and Digital Austin Papers, both of which had won outside funding and gotten decent amounts of attention, all that good stuff, so on and so forth. Along the way, I try to do what Kathleen has suggested, which is talk to my colleagues about a lot of this stuff and put on presentations. And I actually asked the chair if we could do a lunchtime meeting where I could talk about these projects to allow my colleagues to know what, what they were. And we did that, and about four people showed up. Um, and I wowed every, every one of them, I hope, right? We have a department of about 35, but it was hard to get an audience with everybody at once when it wasn't required <laughs> by the department. And it wasn't that I didn't have supportive colleagues. I want to emphasize that too. Everybody in the department was very kind and, and supportive and they often asked me how things were going. And very often they had very kind comments about the things that they understood about what I was doing. <laughs> such as winning NEH grants. Right? Everybody in the department knew what the NEH was. And everybody in the department recognized that winning grants from the NEH is not the easiest thing every time. And so the fact that we won um, several grants for certain projects was a good thing. Having the projects reviewed and featured in digital forums of various sorts was a good thing. Mapping text, for example, was featured in the Journal of Digital Humanities. My Texas Slavery Project had been reviewed by the Journal of American History. They understood some of those things because it, it seemed very analogous in this case, to journals they saw in print form or in the Journal of American History, they got that in the mailbox of the department and saw that and understood that very well. The other thing they understood very readily was that because I was doing digital stuff, I got to give talks at some prominent venues that I might not otherwise have been giving talks at, right? I got to give talks at Harvard and Stanford and Johns Hopkins and Duke and Rice and places like that. And my colleagues understood that that you're invited to give a talk at some of these prominent kinds of places, that made sense to them that this must be something of value, right? This must be something of, and that they, they'd say nice things like that, and they meant them, and they were interested. Um, but the conversation always came back to, so how's that book thing coming along here, right? That's what you're really doing, isn't it? I'm like, well, yes, I'm, I'm definitely working on this. There's no doubt about that, I promise you. I'm working very hard, I've hardly seen my children. Um, but my scholarship is this universe, right? And, and I tried to make a point by using the book to make that point. I was saying, 
See that book over there that I'm, I'm doing, right? It depends in part on several of these projects and the insights that we built out of those as, as research nodes. That's often how I describe them to, to my, my colleagues. The Texas Slavery Project was very direct about that. The newspapers, which were Texas newspapers, we were using a mapping text, was fundamental. And the work we were doing, the digital, digital Austin papers, all of which was undergirding what became the book eventually. And I explained that in great detail. And I also explained to my colleagues, you do understand that all my paperwork that has been given to me says I have to do both. Because just as Kathleen was describing at, uh, at Michigan State, at UNT we have in our department an annual review of everybody in the department. And everybody gets a letter. And it's, it's a kind of check-in for you how you're doing. It's a part of the merit process. But for those on the tenure track, it's building a document trail of how well or not well you're doing along your way to tenure. And it's meant to be a, a, a constant check-in experience. This is the sentence that was always at the end of my letter every single time for, for five years, which is that we trust he will continue to develop new digital projects and, and, produce a fine book to win tenure and promotion to associate professor, right? So a credit to my department in the sense that they were very clear that they expected both, right? I was under no illusions about that. Um, the question is, how are they going to measure both? That's a big challenge here. And that's the, the problem that I constantly had in this whole process besides finding time to do both was to get my department to confront the problem that they hadn't defined how they're, gonna dis how they're going to evaluate digital scholarship. They wanted to, they knew they'd have to do it at some point, but until I'm knocking literally on the door saying this is something we need to deal with very soon, um, they hadn't had to confront it in any sort of meaningful sense, right? Um, and as I'm going through a lot of this process, I think examples are, are how we, we point at, at what works and what doesn't. And my example in my mind was a friend of mine, Will Thomas, um, who had been in Virginia when I was in Virginia. He was the director of the Virginia Center for Digital History when I was there. Um, and Will had gone through a similar process while I was a graduate student at UVA, and I'd watched it up close because Will was in the history department. Um, he had produced a fine book called Lawyering for the Railroad. And when he was going up for tenure at UVA, it was in part because he, he published this book and also and largely because of his work on the Valley of the Shadow project, right? And you know, a, a good output of that was this article down here that the American Historical Review had commissioned called The Differences Slavery Made, um, where Will had this, this whole like, universe of his work that was interconnected in various ways that he was putting in front of the department. And I remember being around him at the time this was going on, and Will never let on that this was a stressful experience, right? But I was stressed just hearing about the whole process um, because it all seemed very murky and undefined and very who knows what's going on. I think all people who go through the tenure process probably experience that to some degree. But with the digital being so undefined, especially at that point, it was all the more so. And I was worried about that, right? So I, I approached my department pretty regularly saying we've got to revise our tenure guidelines within the department. We have a handbook in the department that defines everything we do especially in including tenure. And I know this is some small text here, but these are the tenure requirements that our department handbook had when I arrived. And the, 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 the gold standard is what it says at the top there. A substantial book, which is a monograph published by a well-regarded press, right, that's well-reviewed, that's, that's what you need. However, if you don't have that necessarily, we have some options for you, right? And that's what's down here. You could have, number one, is a scholarly equivalent of a substantial book, a series of full-length research articles, or number two, you could have a book-length synthesis of your field that's not a textbook, but is a synthesis of all the scholarship in a way that, uh, that will be change the field itself, or number three, some amazing combination of all the stuff above that. You can possibly do that, right? But I'm going to point this out, and it was explained to me in these terms. This is an order of importance, all right? Start with a scholarly book. If you have to make your way down from there, don't ever get to number three. All right? Number three is bad. It's literally my chair's words. I like, don't do that. That's not a good idea, which is fair advice, right? But I'm saying, okay, so we need to add the digital and make it not number four, okay? We need to add the digital and not make it number four. And what I had to do to do that was to point out that scholarly organizations had endorsed this and said, this is okay for us to do. It's all right, guys. It'll be all right. 
The, the Modern Language Association has put out guidelines that says that this is something you can do. Here's some guidelines on how you can do it. And I, I, I had to print this out, but I brought it in, in print form, and I started waving it around in my chair. I said, okay, that's all right. I'll take it to the department. But it's, it's English. I don't know that that's really going to count for us. We're history. I know we're all the humanities, but we're really particular about this. Um, so I also brought in the Nebraska um, uh, examples, which, by the way, Will Thomas, by this point, is at Nebraska. And Nebraska had invested in digital humanities in a big and powerful way, so it was in their interest to do this. But they had gone through some of these processes because they had, I want to say problems, but examples of people going through this and had to, had to create this document. It allowed me to then bring that document and wave it around going, it's not just English, it's also history. Can we possibly do something with this, right? So I brought that into my chair. We took it to the executive committee. I brought in and came in and did a little presentation with a PowerPoint, and then I was ushered out of the room where the executive committee in our department was going to decide what we're going to do to revise this. And they came up with, we'll add number four. <laughs> and it says, and I'm sure you can't read it, but it says, some combination of the above and digital scholarship, which has been favorably peer reviewed, all right? So again, <laughs> if you're not supposed to do number three, <laughs> Going down to number four is not going to be a helpful thing, right? It was, to get credit for my department, they wanted to do something. There were fierce debates within that discussion group, as I understand it, coming from some of the more senior members of our department who were very worried about watering down what scholarship meant in terms of outputs, and part, I think, because of unfamiliarity, right? It was hard to understand what is this thing, because I don't know how many of my colleagues I just don't know, really engaged my, my digital projects on their own terms in a way that they could understand what those actually meant in practice, right? They knew what a monograph meant. They know what peer-reviewed journal articles <coughs> look like, right? But this thing feels more murky. Um, but that didn't feel very good to me <laughs> and didn't give me a lot of confidence. So when the AHA issued its guidelines following the model of the MLA, um, saying, let's, let's, no, seriously, we need to do this, and you guys probably can't see the line down there, but it's, the, 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 the lines I pulled from this that I kept waving in front of everybody was, these forms of scholarship and the judgment of the AHA are no less deserving of professional evaluation than Prince scholarship, right? It doesn't need to be number four, all right? It shouldn't be number four. It should be considered as scholarship, and there's lots of ways that can come out, that's lots of forms that that can have its output as. And as I was trying to describe to my colleagues, my book is one output of that. It's not the only output, right? These things flow a lot of different directions and, and go back and forth. So I took that back to my department, back to my chair, who again, I want to emphasize, was very supportive, very wanting to help. And so I said, we really have to revise these before I get to the actual tenure submission portfolio situation and understand what this stuff looks like, particularly because I've been asked by the department since I arrived to do this stuff, right? So we took the debate to, this is the war room right here, all right? This is the, this is the meeting space we have at, uh, in my department. It's a beautiful little library. We all sat around this table. There's about 35 members of our department. So what we did was we called an entire meeting of the whole department that was required by our chair that everybody show up for, all right? So not easy to do. And we got everybody around the table, and we, we, I made a pitch saying, look, I'm coming up for tenure. Here's what I was required to do. We need to evaluate more than just traditional scholarship. And I, while I appreciate the effort that went into making number four here, I do think that we need to evaluate how we can talk about digital scholarship as not the last thing you want to try to do, but something that should be evaluated up there um, with everything else. And so we went back and forth on this. All right? And it got to be a very fierce debate at a certain point. I wasn't sure what kind of reaction I would get. Um, but some of my colleagues were very resistant to the idea of walking away from, you have to publish something in print form. And a lot of that, I think, came down to that is something that was familiar. That was something they felt comfortable evaluating their, their fellow scholars on in fields they're not familiar with. So if I do Borderlands history, but you do medieval history, <laughs> but we both know that Oxford University Press is a good university press, there seems to be a sense of I can evaluate that. And with the digital, it felt a lot more murky. But at a certain point, we got to us talking about we need to eliminate the and. Digital scholarship needs to be able to stand on its own. It has to be proven as valuable. 
It needs to be seen as insightful. It needs to bring something to the table, just like any other form of scholarship. But it can't be said as something that you only add to other more traditional forms, or we're never going to get anybody here who's willing to go out on a platform and really try something innovative in digital methodology. right? And that became a fight in the department. All right? Not a long fight, a short fight. We had a debate about it. Some folks who resisted the idea of walking away from the monograph. And a lot of their argument was, you, Andrew, already gonna, are already going to have a book. So this doesn't matter. So we don't have to do that. And if we do that, then someone else is going to come along with something that isn't a very strong digital project, and that's going to tank them, and it's really a disservice to all of us by opening, opening that door to who knows what comes next. All right? And I said, well, here's the thing. We have to deal with this, and we need to deal with it in my case, not only because I was asked to do it, but because if we don't, the next person who comes down here is going to have to fight that fight all over again, and we don't want to limit ourselves as a department and say that the next candidate we can we bring onto our, into our department can't be somebody who has a primarily digital portfolio by limiting that capacity. So we got into this argument, we, we was amicable, I want to emphasize that, everybody was trying to have an open, honest conversation, and we did. And we changed, ultimately, with the vote of the department, we changed the tenure requirements, where four is gone, well actually, four, they got replaced. But digital scholarship moved up to number three. <laughs> But it was described not as an and situation, but this digital scholarship was described as an or, more of an or, right? It's still pointing to the scholarly equivalent idea, it's still pointing to the monograph, it's still pointing to all of those sort of outputs because that was the compromise that we came up with essentially, right? But it went from and to an or kind of circumstance, right? Which was a major victory in the department. And it meant that we could take uh, my portfolio going forward and send it out for review. And this all happened literally within months of me having to send out my entire portfolio, which is why we dealt with it then. And until it became a problem we could no longer avoid, it kept getting kicked down the road. All right? Again, not because anyone wasn't in favor of me getting tenure and didn't want to support me, it's because they didn't know how to do it, and so until it became an emergency situation, it was easier to defer those problems and those difficult decisions. But once we got through that, then we could take this entire portfolio and send it out, but then the question became, well, how do we do that? <laughs> we know how to get a couple copies of your book and send it out to people. What on earth do we do with this mishmash of stuff, right? Do we print it out in a big pile? I said, no. This is mostly data visualization stuff. That isn't going to work almost at all. So we had to go back to the war room and have another debate. We had another department meeting to decide how we were going to do this. It's very democratic. And what we came up with is, well, the department requires five outside reviewers for your traditional scholarship, Andrew. So we're going to do that, and then we'll get five additional reviewers to do your digital scholarship. So instead of five letters in your file, you're going to have ten letters in your file. But we really should ask 15 people to do that. So let's get to see how many letters we can cram into your file and put the whole thing together. And so, which, you know, God bless America, that terrified me because it was, it was the idea of having that many people evaluating your scholarship from all kinds of angles, all coming into one file that's, that the tenure committee was going to read, the college committee was going to read. How bifurcated was that going to be, or was that going to be what I hoped it would be, which is something that talked about this unity of vision, right? That these things do fit together, right? So I, I wrote my personal statement around that. But what we ended up doing is that we, we had a list for my traditional stuff that sent that out. And then we had a, a digital uh, portfolio that they had me write up basically a 25-page single-space precy on every project that I built, what it was, how it worked, um, what my role was. So this is the problem of collaboration within digital humanities that doesn't fit into the monk scholar model we have usually within the humanities itself. So you know, I had all my projects that I was in there. This is mapping text, so this is what it was, this is how we did it, this is what I did, this is why I think it's important, these are reviews of it. It's basically paper form version of that with links to the projects. What made me feel good about that is that it was being sent to other digital humanities scholars who I felt sure would at least engage the digital projects in their own terms online and explore them and using this as a guide for my particular role in those you know, very large and, and collaborative projects. So we did all of that. And at the end of it all, we got all the letters came in. The portfolio was a traditional paper portfolio that had references to outside digital projects that people could go look at. It got voted on in our department, and it was 
it was a unanimous vote. Everybody approved um, recommending me for tenure. It went up the line to the college, and the college at this point had decided it's going to follow my department's lead and whatever this looks like. The college was going to figure out how to deal with me based on how my department dealt with me. And so they took the model that we had established within the department, brought that up the line, approved that as well, and I was fortunately, mercifully, granted tenure. Yes, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> My wife was the one applauding at the end of when we got this letter. It's amazing how anticlimactic this letter really is by the time it gets there. It's like, good, you're not fired. <laughs> so excited. Um, that was thrilling, and tenure is, a, tenure is an amazing thing. Tenure is an amazing part of, of, of the academy, and it's a very important thing, and I feel very strongly about it. So I was, I was thrilled to death. It's something I've been aiming for for a long time. But I'm, in many ways, I'm more proud of the discussions that went on in here, because Despite there was resistance, and there was from senior scholars, and not everybody was thrilled with what our department ultimately decided, but we did decide it because we had a case in real life experience where we had to decide this. And we had open conversations, we had lots of different viewpoints. I had a particular one, we had other members who had a very different one, but we had open and honest dialogue. And that was more possible because of what the MLA and the AHA had done in issuing those guidelines. Um, and it was also possible because you showed these digital projects as outputs that had things that they could understand, like NEH grants and invited lectures in different places. Um, and ultimately because they wanted to keep the scholarship that I was doing. And that's a good thing. And by having these fights, we've opened the door now to hiring new people who do digital humanities work, who do digital scholarship work as a primary thing. And I'm very proud to say that this, last, this fall, we just hired a new medieval historian in our department whose portfolio is primarily digital. Mm -hmm. And so when she comes into the department, part of the reason we could sell her on coming to the department is that we have these guidelines now. We've gone through this process before. You can count on that going forward as something that is a, a, something that you don't have to invent along the way. And it is very much to our department's benefit for having gone through that process as we are growing now as a DH community. So thank you guys. I appreciate you listening to me. Running late, um, maybe just one or two burning questions for Andrew. Yes, ma'am. So, is the solution then that the digital scholar has to write a 25-page written thing about the digital project? Well, I don't think that. I didn't enjoy that. Um, <laughs> just for the record, but. I don't know that you have to do it the way I did it. What, what, the way we did it was you could see very cumbersome, right? It's kind of everything. It's the everything solution, the and solution, right? Um, and I was trying to translate so much of what I was doing to people who didn't know it and weren't really interested in engaging it. So my department asked me to do that in part for the members of my department who aren't interested in, in engaging the digital, but also to ensure that, that everybody did read some aspect of what I was doing in this, in this regard. And I think it was good to document my role and, and delineate that from a, a my collaborators in explicit ways. And it gave me a chance really to highlight things in many ways that my personal statement that was at the beginning of my whole dossier about here's what I've done, this is why it's important. This gave me a chance to highlight those connections with the digital. So that was probably a little overkill, but it came also from all those debates that we had. And I didn't want to like leave a lot to chance in this kind of all or nothing tenure decision experience. Um, so, what I'm, so our, our new colleague in our department, one of the things I'm going to, my advice to her will be a stripped down version of that. Um, but I think she'll have more buy-in from our, our department colleagues because we've already gone through that process and things didn't explode as a result. Yes, sir. Just really, two quick questions. One, um, how was it received by other departments on your campus? Did they look to you because of other digital humanists coming on board? So they which department did they come to you? And secondly, when you guys were talking about guidelines, you talked about AHA and MLA. Did you try to benchmark, did any of the other UT system schools have guidelines for tenure at that point with digital humanities? Um, well, UNT is not in the UT system. Um, but no, not really. Um, I, can, I can tell you the UT system doesn't, the, is, is, is grappling with that right now. Um, the other departments on our campus didn't have a lot of conversation with our department about DH stuff. Most of the DH discussions went through the library system, um, which has a very robust um, 
DH community discussion group that's been going on for some time, thanks um, uh, because of Martin. Um, so a lot of those conversations flowed in and out of the library, and there was kind of cross-pollinization from our department, the English department, political science, where we have different people working in some of these areas. Um, but I'm not aware at UNT of anybody else uh, in the last couple, two years since I was tenured who've gone through that process explicitly. I think our department is the next likely to go through that, unless English or um, poli-sci or one of the other um, humanities or social sciences have hired somebody in the tenure line that I'm unaware of. Um, but I'm hoping to make that a part of the conversation. And I know that our dean level understands that that has gone through, and so that's going to be, in many ways, I think the pipeline of us departments hire people, finding out what are my requirements, what are our discussions as chairs talk to deans, that, hey, history's done this, that's something that you guys can use as a starting point. Please join me in thanking everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you.